welcome everyone. I'm Bridget Delicato from Mindful Gardening and the Innisfil Seed Library, and welcome to our live Q&A. This session is part of the series Get Out and Grow, which is happening throughout the season, and it's in partnership with the Rosardo Health and Wellness Centre. And you'll find the registration info on the Rosardo Health and Wellness Centre website and also on the Mindful Gardening website, which I have on this uh, first slide. And we also have Sarah Health Associate uh, on this call as well. So she's helped uh, get this all happening. Um, we're also recording um, tonight's session. So you may want to turn off your camera if you're camera shy, if you prefer. Uh, for questions, you can uh, speak when, uh, when the question uh, period comes up, or you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. So the goal for tonight is to answer mostly your vegetable gardening questions. And I'll share some natural organic strategies for dealing with common garden issues that you might be seeing right now and to offer some information and resources that will help you succeed this season. So let's get started. So these are just some common things to consider right now. Um, fertilizing, watering, and maximizing your harvest. In terms of fertilizing, this is really uh, sort of supplemental fertilizing. If you have a really good, healthy soil base, so something you've been building over time with compost and you're chopping up your fall leaves and adding that to your soil and you have a really rich base, you'll probably have really good, healthy plants throughout the season that won't need any, any supplements. Fertilizing um, or adding supplements to your to your soil is typically something you might want to think about for your potted plants. Because even if you're using a good organic potting mix, you know, formulated for herbs and vegetables, those plants are still depleting what's sort of trapped in that container. So your tomatoes, which are typically heavy feeders, they're going to be taking up a lot of, of those nutrients. So you may want to supplement. And I've just included some of my favorites. Um, I know I talked about comfrey tea at my uh, planning your garden uh, webinar uh, about a month ago. And it's just really an all around good, uh, it's got the, you know, nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus in it. It's got trace minerals. It's just a really good boost. Um, I find if uh, my plants are looking a little sad or the fruits aren't setting um, as well as I'd like, um, giving it a good, a good shot of that comfrey tea is a, is a good boost and I do see results. Um, and you can look up that recipe online. It's, it's quite easy and it's something great if you can grow it in your garden. Uh, sea kelp and fish emulsion, those are both supplements that you actually spray directly on the leaves and it's absorbed through the leaves um, and into the plant. So again, that's something that you can um, buy commercially and you know read the instructions. And the earlier you apply that in the morning, the better so that you're not burning your leaves because typically we don't really want to be spraying any liquid on our leaves and having the sun hit them and burn them. Um, you can also top dress um, your, your gardens with, with plant compost, but be careful with, with manure because that can, again, be a little too rich and can burn, burn your plants. Um, so looking at watering, I mean, we've had such a dry uh, spring so far. It was cold and wet at the beginning, but it's definitely been pretty dry, uh, quite, quite a drought we're experiencing. So you're going to want to make sure that your plants uh, are well watered to keep them healthy, to help them, you know, get to the point where they're going to produce fruit or if they're leafing, you know, giving them enough water. So you're looking at hand watering at the base of the plant. A drip hose is great because it goes right to the soil. Again, you don't want to be splashing water directly on top of your leaves because wetness can lead to disease. Um, and moisture, trapping, all sorts of bad stuff. So getting that water right at the soil line is, is really important. Mulching is great. It helps to retain that water, keeps the weeds down, keeps the cool, the, um, the roots cool. So that's really a great uh, technique to use. And I love to use, again, my chopped up fall leaves, if you're lucky enough, enough to have trees on your property, collect those leaves, mulch them or grind them up if you have a, a shredder and they just make a wonderful addition to feed your soil or to mulch. So that's one of the, one of the best ways to mulch. Or you can use straw. Um, you can use, I guess, wood mulches as well, but I prefer sort of stuff that actually breaks down really nicely and the worms like it too. Um, maximizing your harvest is sort of a 
big topic, but I'm just going to kind of focus on um, tomatoes and basil, which I think a lot of us like growing. And initially, you're, or essentially, you're looking at pruning away um, leaves that put energy um, into those leaves rather than into the fruit. So you may have heard of suckers on tomatoes, which are essentially um, leaves that are growing sort of in the armpit of a plant. So if you've got your main stem and then an arm growing, you'll have these little um, buds coming up of, of suckers. You can also Google to see what that looks like, uh, Google tomato suckers. Uh, removing those will again put the energy back into the fruiting of the plant. Sometimes your tomato plants will get so large and unruly that you can actually remove entire arms of that plant. And it may sacrifice a few um, tomatoes, but you'll have a more tidy plant. And of course, staking it and keeping it upright, um, not allowing leaves to drag on the ground. Again, you can trim those leaves as well. So I've trimmed about a foot of my bottom leaves of my tomato plants because they're quite tall now. Um, they're averaging two to three feet at this point. So taking off that bottom foliage will allow airflow under there, prevent disease, and again, put energy up top where the, the fruits are happening. I do have a video on my Mindful Gardening YouTube channel on how to prune both tomatoes and basil to get more harvest. There's a little trick for basil um, to promote more, more leaves growing. So I really suggest that you check that out. Another way to maximize your harvest is uh, encouraging pollination. Now, of course, pollinators are in our garden doing a lot of that work, but you can kind of speed things up. So we have self-pollinating plants like tomatoes, lettuce as well. Now, because what that means is the flowers have both the male and female parts. So that pollen just needs a little shake uh, to pollinate. So what you can do is just go around and tap your plants, literally just tap the plant. You can tap the trellis that they're on or the tomato cage, and that little shake will just get that pollen moving and pollinate. And of course, the bugs will do that for you as well. But again, you can speed things up. I know some people have used an electric toothbrush, but quite honestly, your hand can do the job, just a, a little tap. Um, for non-self-pollinating, so squashes, for example, they've got a male flower and a female flower that are required to cross-pollinate in order or to pollinate. Um, in order for fruit to develop. So we do rely on insects to do that, but you can be a little helper as well. Um, it's good to do it early in the day once the, the blossoms of your, of your let's say, um, zucchini is, is blooming. So you find the, the male flower, which will have the pollen on it. You take that with a Q-tip and then apply it to the female uh, interior of her flower. And there you go, you've pollinated. Um, and you can do that, um, Every day, the flowers may fade and you'll see that little fruit growing. Of course, insects will do that too, but it's a little trick that uh, will encourage pollination and give you more harvest. And of course, to get those pollinators in your garden, uh, it's really important to have other plants in your, gar in your vegetable garden, like flowers, that will encourage all of those beneficial insects to come into your garden and pollinate your veggies too. And you can look at companion planting, so things that grow well together, Again, encouraging um, just a nice sort of diversity in your, in your garden that attracts pollinators. It's, you know, in some cases too, if you, if you plant things that are very fragrant, it can sometimes um, also attract pollinators. So you've got your basil, rosemary, those kinds of things are really good. So just sort of three sort of main things to kind of consider. And, um, you know, it's, it's three things to really look at as you're developing your veggie garden. Now you may have these questions too. And again, any questions you have, um, whether I cover them or not, uh, in my little spiel here, please uh, enter them in the chat box and uh, we can uh, take those up. So of course, wildlife is, is something that I think a lot of us um, encounter. Um, in Innisfil Berry, I think, you know, the little guys, the chipmunks and the rabbits and the squirrels are kind of uh, are our main little little guys that come in their gardens and, and cause a ruckus. Uh, also, you can get the nighttime critters as well, like the skunks and the raccoons and things like that. Um, deer, I don't think are as big a problem uh, for us, but I know um, if you're in a more rural property, that might, might not be the case. Um, and my approach generally is, you know, wildlife is simply a part of gardening. Um, some of us experience more than others, and it's really, um, 
looking at taking action to lessen their impact, but knowing and accepting that they will probably be an ongoing challenge and just kind of rolling with it, learning from it and seeing, you know, what you can do to preserve your plants from them. So I'm an advocate of creating barriers um, for some of these critters uh, and deterrence um, over applying anything that's potentially harmful. I know some people think of putting, you know, cayenne pepper down and, you know, I just imagine these little sad bunnies rubbing their eyes and, you know, you don't want to hurt wildlife as well or add anything unnatural or chemical to your plants that is going to affect your soil and in turn the food that you're eating. So again, you want to create good um, environment, good soil, and you don't want to add things to it that will ultimately hurt it and make it more vulnerable. So in terms of uh, barriers, you know, you're looking at fencing. Some people do put up a nice full, you know, six foot fence. Um, again, with rabbits, some things do burrow. So you'll want to get that fence under the soil line. Um, again, you've got openings in the in those uh, fences. I have literally seen a rabbit jump through a hole in a fence, which is kind of funny. Um, uh, someone was kind of bragging about this wonderful fence they built and that happened as we were standing there. Um, so, you know, at your best efforts um, can sometimes not, not work out. But again, you can build a fence. Um, raised beds tend to um, keep rabbits out, I find. Uh, just having that little extra lift, they're sort of, you know, more ground level. But of course, your chipmunks and your squirrels won't mind climbing. Um, I like to cover my pots with a fine plastic mesh, like the soft um, fencing mesh that you'll find, like very, like one inch square. And then I'll secure it with sticks. I particularly do this if I'm, um, direct sowing some seeds in there. So it's just a nice little pot of, of soil that they can go and dig and hide their nuts and such. So I find that just that little barrier, they don't, they don't try to get in there. Um, they don't want to get tangled up in it. Um, I have really young lettuce right now in a very large, uh, uh, container and I've got the mesh over it still. The plants can still grow quite well. Um, but again, I'm not getting those little creatures in there digging up and, and ruining all my, my yummy stuff. And another um, thing you can try is uh, garden fabric, more so for insects um, that lay eggs. So over your kale against cabbage moths, I'll be talking about insects more in a bit. Um, but you might want to think about that. Um, and also for cucumber beetles, you can be really determined and cover your squash plants as they're getting more mature under uh, a row cover. Um, and that way, when it's much larger and more mature and they start to flower, of course, you'll want to remove that covering so that they can pollinate, but your plant will be a lot bigger, more mature, and less susceptible to being killed by any insects that, that might harm it. So that's something to think about, um, the garden fabric. Deterrence um, are just sort of, you know, ways to kind of not even let them go there. Um, cats, surprisingly, maybe not so surprisingly, um, I do have neighborhood cats that are, that are outdoor. Um, so they're not my cats, but they're my little friendly neighbors that really do keep uh, chipmunks at bay. So if you do have cats around, I know they can scare birds off and such, but they've been a really great uh, little soldiers in my garden, um, keeping those, those guys at bay. And they come out in the morning and they're kind of out and out and about all day. So they do keep things, things away. Um, another trick I, I use, and I, you know, sort of looking up, you know, what can I do, especially again for pots and things like that. If you invert forks, so you've got the pointy side of the fork up, and you just put several of them through throughout your little seedling, young seedlings. Um, generally, critters don't want to go in there. They don't want to get poked. That is just a deterrent. They don't even try going in there. Um, you can use little sticks as well. So again, you're not, you know, um, tricking them. You're not trapping them and hurting them. You're just creating a a barrier that they're not wanting to to investigate because they kind of know they're going to get hurt. Um, you can also try uh, companion plants, um, including marigolds, which can be a deterrent for bunnies, um, or again, scented herbs can, can uh, keep some, some things at bay. Um, you may have heard of head manure um, being used um, uh, when planting bulbs, especially. So if you're planting flower bulbs and that kind of thing, uh, generally squirrels don't like uh, the smell of it. But again, the head manure is good for your garden. So you know, it's kind of a, a double bonus there. So again, try to try to create barriers, deterrence, and just avoid adding anything um, that can that can harm them. I'm just going to sort of run through sort of ten 
uh, common pests that you may or may not be seeing in your garden. Um, I see um, pretty much all of these. And uh, so I'm just going to kind of describe what they are. And again, like the wildlife, they're just sort of a natural part of what you're going to come to expect. And it's going to basically um, be diligent. That's really the main thing. You're going to be out in your garden, uh, like a little detective, uh, looking at damage, trying to understand what is causing it, what plants is this happening to, does this happen every year? So again, you're sort of building your arsenal of uh, information, like what, what insects um, am I worried about here? So, um, and if you get ahead of it, you can, you can save your plants. So don't be discouraged if slugs have eaten your bean plants, which they're doing to mine currently. Um, if you can get ahead of it and that plant can get more leaves and more maturity, it, it can survive and, and do well. So don't despair. So flea beetles, you may be familiar with, they create tiny little perfect holes uh, all over many different types of plants uh, and flowers. And they're really fast and they jump very quickly. So they're hard to capture, to, to squish. So, um, you know, if you have a very infested area, you might think of doing a, a combination of uh, soap, alcohol, and water spray. Again, look up a recipe for um, the, the ratio uh, of those. Um, but generally, you know, you can do your best to, to deter them. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one. They're kind of, to me, the fastest, hardest ones to get a handle on. Japanese beetles, um, they are on their way. They usually um, emerge uh, as adult beetles, these little shiny guys, uh, this month. So you, you will start seeing them. They love all sorts of plants. Um, they do love plants in the rose family, which unfortunately also includes raspberries or in the rose family. So you may, uh, if you have a nice raspberry patch, you may have uh, an infestation of, of these guys. And they um, basically will skeletonize uh, plants. They'll eat complete leaves. Now, the best way, again, you're diligent, you're coming out in the morning when the sun starts hitting your plants, and they do like to travel in groups. Um, they, uh, their reflex is to fall if you, if you disturb them. So a great technique is to go around with a soapy pail of water, have it underneath the plant that they're infesting, tap the plant, and they will fall and drown. That's kind of one of the easiest ways. I've also squish them. They do have little pointy, uh, um, I guess, I'm not going to call them claws, but <laughs> they do have uh, little points on them, little sharp bits. So if you're, if that's something you'd like to try, you know, garden gloves are always good, um, but they do react quite well to, to falling into soapy water and drowning. Uh, cucumber beetles, uh, same thing. Um, they will go after all your squash plants. Um, they're, they're kind of a, a given if you do have, if you do have uh, squash plants, so cucumber, zucchini, uh, winter and summer squash, um, you'll, you will likely see these little stripy guys. Um, and they will, will you know, again, eat your leaves. Um, as I said, if early in the season, you can cover your plants with uh, row cover before um, they flower and get some nice, robust, healthy plants at first, the damage won't be too bad. But again, if you're out there, you're diligent in the morning, come out and uh, either squish them or, or dunk them into soapy water. And again, just keep, keep on top of it. Be that detective that comes out and uh, looks after your, your plants on a daily basis. Now, cutworm is, I think, something new that I've discovered this year. Um, they are little creatures that come out at night. So we've got your, you know, your daytime sunny beetles, and then you've got this little worm that comes out at night and essentially will cut um, young seedlings typically right at their base. Um, they don't eat the plant, they just knock it over. So I discovered um, for a couple of mornings, um, my, my newly uh, emerging bean plants being knocked over mostly. And that's by the description what I, what I think I have. So I'll be showing a little technique in the next slide of, of how I'm dealing with that. Slugs also uh, come out at night typically. Now they like moisture. So one trick is don't water your plants late in the day. You'll want to water them early in the day so that you know, you've got the evaporation and the sun and, and the absorption of that water into your soil before, before night sets, because slugs, as you may know, like to slither along on wet surfaces. So, so they love uh, nice, moist areas. 
Um, and again, they, they come out at night. I, I have not been able to see the cutworm, unfortunately, uh, to squish him. Um, but the slugs, they're very slow moving and they are on the plant at night. So it, literally as soon as the sun goes down, I can sure as sure as rain see that they are on my on those bean plants. So I go hand squish. Um, and you know, that seems to be working. The plants are developing new leaves. And I do find I've I have this problem uh annually in the same spot, uh, oddly enough. So I know what to expect in that spot. And last year the plants did well. Once they sort of reached maturity, um, they were pole beans. Uh, were able to climb the trellis. They, the, the slugs no longer did their their bad work on the on the young ones. So just to show you my defense for cutworms. So this is my little veggie garden. This is about a, a week or so ago. Um, so yeah, so they were they were cut. Oh, they're also cutting down some of my kale plants as well. So what I've done is taken uh, plastic and foam cups and cut the bottoms out and made a little. Uh, basically ring around my um, around my plants. And what that does is, and then sort of having the soil around the bottom, around the soil, uh, or sorry, around the cup at the bottom, that way the, the cutworm does, doesn't get to the base of the plant. Um, and that seems to be working. Um, the, you know, since I put them up a week ago, there has been no further damage. Uh, another trick some people use uh, is to put a nail or a stick, or better yet two, on either side of the stem. So the cutworm literally goes around the stem and cuts it with its body. So if you have a, a barrier there, they can't do that work. So, you know, that might've been a little more attractive if I had <laughs> done that, but uh, I had these extra silo cups around and these foam cups. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give it a try. Again, something I can share with you guys or, you know, know that this is something that was successful. Now I did try this with those beans um, that were, uh, that I was talking about with the slugs, but the slugs still made their way, you know, up the cup, down the cup, up the stem. So it was not unfortunately a deterrent uh, for them. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with how that worked out. It's kind of a colorful garden. So this is my uh, last insect slide and then we'll, we'll take up your questions. Um, so these are another five common ones you may see, cabbage worm, they are so crafty in that they are so well camouflaged. You can even imagine that that's not the spine of the plant, that is a, a cabbage worm. So they're the larva of those little white cabbage moths that you see flying around, you know, flittering around and they're hard to catch too. So when you, when you do see the, the, the moth itself, the moth is hard to, to catch, but these little guys, uh, the, the larva are quite slow moving, very easy to squash uh, once you detect them. And they love anything in the brassica family. So you'll see them on cabbage and kale, and they will completely defoliate um, very quickly. And there's usually several of them on one plant. So again, you've got to be that detective that goes out uh, and checks on your plants and you know squishes them. And again, um, kale can also be something that you grow under under cover so that those moths can't lay their eggs in the first place. And they do lay the, their eggs most pests will lay their eggs on the underside of leaves. So that's another detective technique that you can use. Look under the leaves and see what you, what you see with cabbage moths or little yellowy orange uh, eggs, very small grouping of them, but easy to see. So if you can destroy their eggs before they even get to this stage, then you're, then you're doing really good. Um, the second one, leek moth larva. So those are um, in the allium family. So any of the onion family, so leeks, of course. Garlic, you might see this sort of infestation um, and you'll see it sort of along the stem. Um, and again, you want to, uh, another thing you could do with them as well is, is row cover to prevent the laying of eggs. So anything preventative you can do um, is always good, especially if it's a plant that doesn't flower and need pollination. It's something that, you know, you could cover um, for quite a while and you'll still grow things because through that um, cover, you know, rain and sun and all of that stuff still gets through. I, I've had a little bit of that uh, infestation, but I have seen people have their garlic crops um, sort of decimated. And again, something I want to think about is rotating your crops, which is very important. Um, and that's really with, with all pests. The more you move your plants each season, um, those larvae that are 
you know, a lot of them overwinter in the soil. So if you plant, you know, your alliums again in that same spot or your tomatoes where you had either a disease like blight or you had, you know, a, an insect that was sort of ravaging it, if you keep planting them in that same spot, they're probably just under the earth waiting to come out and do damage again. So rotating your crops is, is really important. Keep moving them around. Potato beetles, of course, they can affect your uh, potato plants. Those similar to the, um, the Japanese beetle, you might want to think of hand picking and either squishing or dunking them in soapy water. Now, these little funny guys, uh, the tortoise beetle, are new, were new to me last year. I discovered them. They're sort of these weird little aliens. They're basically a beetle under a little tortoise shell almost. Um, and they were just sitting on my uh, potato plant leaves, just, just a couple of them. And I noticed, as you can see in the picture, the, you know, a couple of holes. Um, so yeah, they, they go after things in the nightshade family. So they could go for your tomatoes and your peppers and your potatoes. Again, if you plant, you know, those crops close to each other, then all those plants will likely um, get this insect on them. Or if you plant those plants perpetually in the same spot, their larva can keep, you know, making their, their presence known. Um, they're very slow moving as well, um, like a turtle. Uh, so easy, easy to squish. I didn't find it, it did too much damage, but it was something um, that I could imagine if left unattended um, and if they're, you know, mating and creating, uh, you know, more larva, then they're just going to become a pest and a problem. So getting ahead of it, like I did last season, I think I'm, I'm well ahead for this season. Uh, tomato hornworm is another uh, well camouflaged little beast. Um, so that's a little uh, caterpillar that will um, basically decimate your your tomato foliage. Um, and again, they they will affect all nightshade plants. So again, your tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, potatoes. Um, so again, you want to be vigilant and hand pick um, hand pick these. So yeah, really, with a lot of these insect pests, you're looking at um, you know, trying to find companion plants to attract other insects that will hopefully eat these insects. Um, I didn't describe aphids here, but ladybugs love aphids and ants love aphids. So if you can get other beneficial insects to um, come into your yard or predatory wasps, for example, they might do the work for you and eat some of these, these guys that you don't like. So again, introducing a lot of flowers into your garden is, is really a good thing. Um, there's also something called a trap crop, um, which is essentially a plant that will attract some of these guys you don't want so that it leaves your other plants uh, unharmed. Um, nasturtium, which is a beautiful flowering plant, um, is a trap crop. So it doesn't really hurt the nasturtium too much. It doesn't kill the plant, but those aphids will go for that instead of your roses, for example, or any other plant that you're finding, um, your little, those little aphids. Um, and again, you're rotating those crops so that those pests that are living uh, in the soil aren't re-emerging and attacking your plants again. And it's really important too to sort of learn about these bugs. If you're finding you always have cabbage worm or you always have tomato hornworm, learn about their life cycle. Like what, when do they, you know, what is their larva behavior? Do they overwinter in the soil? Um, do they, you know, what is their behavior? When, when can I expect to see them? Then you can get ahead of them a little bit. You can look for their eggs. Where do they lay their eggs? What does the larva look like? So that way you can kind of have a bit of a, an arsenal before it's too late. So that's sort of common um, things to look at, common pests and that sort of thing. So now I'm happy to take any questions <laughs> if I if I didn't cover um, something uh, in my little spiel there that you'd like like to know about. I have a question. Is that Patty? Yeah, it's Patty. Um, I have a pot with a tomato plant growing in the center and four lettuce plants around it. Okay. And everything was looking quite lovely. And I started picking the lettuce, but now um, the lettuce is getting taller, but it just, pieces just seem to be growing from the top of it. Aha, that uh, is, I think your lettuce is bolting. Have you heard of that term before? No. Aha. <laughs> so lettuce um, is typically a cool season vegetable. They like 
you know, the coolness of spring. Um, there's something you can grow again in the fall, but we've had some really hot days. You know, we've already had weather in the thirties and bolting is essentially your, um, lettuce plant is going to seed. So that center sort of rising spike up the center is yeah. going to form eventually flowers at the top of it. So when this happens, you might also be finding that the lettuce is a little bitter. Um, when you pick it at the picking point, you might notice some sort of white uh, substance, little liquid. It's basically kind of become an inedible at this point. Um, there's really no way to stop that process, even nipping off the top of it. It's still, it's still kind of in its uh, dormant stage. It's starting to want to go to seed and uh, kind of end its life cycle for the season. So that's what I suspect is happening. If you're seeing that sort of rising up the center, you could probably still get some edibles uh, off the bottom. But once it gets to a, like a foot, it, they actually get to be about five feet tall when you, if you really let it go they will get very tall and produce seeds for you. Um, again, in a pot and you've got your tomatoes there, you probably don't want to do that for seed collection. Um, but I suspect that's probably what's happening. So it's probably time to, to remove those. Um, one thing you could try is growing uh, lettuce in there again. And now you've got the shade of the um, tomato plant, which might you know, kind of protected a bit because you can grow lettuce through the summer, but they prefer, you know, less, less of that heat. So you can get away with growing them between plants or, you know, where they're not getting too much uh, intensity of sun. So that's something you could try. Could I take out the lettuce and put in basil? Yes. That's what I do actually. Yeah. And then you've got your, you'll have your basil and tomato plants. will will they've got the same sort of schedule. So they'll be growing right through till just before frost. So yeah, I've got, um, like you said, you had your four lettuce plants. You could put four, four uh, little basil plants underneath and you, yeah, you can ha have that grow quite happily. What you'll want to do is remove um, the bottom leaves of your tomato plant to give them room to grow. And again, you can, you know, once your plant, your tomato plant gets quite large, you can remove, you know, at least a foot of, of leaves off the bottom. And that way they'll give give uh, a little bit of sun and air and room for your basil plants to grow. May I ask one more question? And this will be the last one. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, I have like an enormous tomato cage around that poor tomato. Can I like just like put in some kind of a, a long skinny stick and tie the tomato to the stick? Certainly, yep. I have heard um, some people hate the tomato cages. Um, a lot of tomato cages are quite small too, and they're kind of, their shape doesn't really accommodate what happens with the uh, indeterminate tomato. So the indeterminate tomato uh, is essentially uh, a vining plant, really. They'll just keep growing. Uh, cages are good for sort of more of the bush variety. So they stay compact and small and, you know, it gives a little bit of support. But you could, if you're able to, if the plant's not too uh, big and unmanageable to carefully remove that cage, yeah, you can simply put um, even just one stick behind it and kind of, um, as it grows, keep keep encouraging it to go up that stick. Um, okay. Again, it, it'll give it better airflow than a cage would anyway, as well. I hate the cage. It looks... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And it's, I mean, again, be careful, especially now that your plant's a little established um, in the future, um, put that, that other kind of staking or trellis, do that at planting so that you're not disturbing the root system too much. But tomatoes are pretty tough. Um, some plants like cucumbers have a delicate uh, root system. So you don't want to be stabbing the roots uh, once they're growing. And especially when they're in a pot, the roots are probably really expanding in that pot now. So if you just kind of carefully wiggle that that uh, cage out and put your trellis in, and of course you'll want to um, use some sort of, uh, I like that sort of soft spongy twine or there's like uh, gardening tape to attach it to that stick or it'll just flop. So you want to also have something to support it to that stick. Mm -hmm. And two, two sticks might be even better. Um, or you could just have it go up that main that main stem. But I have seen gardeners that just have a row of tomatoes 
um, with with large stakes right you know up the center of it and it does give more airflow because if you think about a cage it's sort of circular and those leaves are all kind of huddled in there whereas opening it up is actually better um yeah thank you yeah give that a try you're welcome I don't see any uh, questions in the chat box. Does anyone else have a, a question? They can either type in or um, talk about it in in person. You don't have to be on camera, but you can we can hear your voice if you like. I can share a question that I got emailed in advance of this to ask you. Sounds good, Sarah. Um, Okay, so there they have a number of fruit trees which are being attacked um, after the fruit formation. So they believe it's an insect which like spikes a puncture in the fruit um, and then when it matures, it's not edible. Um, they've tried soap spray and sulfur spray, which I guess hasn't worked. Do you have any ideas? Yeah, it's it's likely, I know with some fruit trees, um, it could be something that uh, the insects, again, are under the soil over winter and then they emerge in the spring. And there are certain uh, treatments that can be done early in spring. At this point, it's, it's too late because they've already, um, you know, probably flowered and fruited. But in early spring, it's like a dormant spray um, that can be applied um, to the leaves and it basically will kill any of those larvae um, that come up. So again, it's sort of something you have to look at if you can determine what the insect is. Um, a really good tip, um, actually, I'm just gonna do my little next slide here, my number two bullet point. Um, so you've noticed some damage on your plant. So what kind of damage? So like they're thinking, you know, when I guess when the fruit develops, there's already holes in the fruit. Um, what plant family is it? So is it all of your fruit trees? Is it just your apple trees, um, for example? And if you're lucky enough, did you see the insect? And, you know, then you can kind of take those three bits of information and try to identify the culprit and then find the best plan of action to, to deal with it. Um, and really, especially with insect damage, really knowing their habits and their life cycle is what's really key because typically when the damage is really done and they can't even eat the fruit you know you're a little too late but it's something that for next year um you know if if that's something you can get on top of and know what to do either in the fall or early spring to help deter them then you'll, you'll be in a much better position i mean there's all sorts of all sorts of insects out there that that uh, that do cause destruction and, and can make some of your food inedible. But again, kind of having a plan and, and preferably a natural organic plan um, is is something that that you can look at. But there's so many resources out there that that can help you once you've identified what the issue is. Um, and there's also um, I know for some fruits um, in, in terms of companion planting, if you plant garlic near um, some of your fruit trees that can be a deterrent for some insects. They just they don't like the the smell of it, or it's just it it's not something they they like. So if you you can even grow them right underneath the tree. So that's something um, a technique that you can try um, for for pests uh, on your fruit trees, or also on on your roses if you plant your garlic near your roses that can help help them as well. Um, yeah, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. Um, there's, unfortunately, um, you know, if we can try to avoid just a quick, you know, chemical solution, because really they'll just come back. It's kind of figuring out um, how you can prevent it from getting to the point where it's it's so damaging and uh, sort of nipping it in the bud uh, to those those pests that are making their appearance when they do. <laughs> um, and it. Again, another sort of tip here is really aim for diversity in your garden with what you plant and where you plant it. Um, so just like growing a variety of, of different things. So incorporating flowers and herbs with your vegetables. Um, you know, again, looking at companion planting, there's all sorts of resources out there that kind of tell you, you know, plants that work well together because, you know, certain insects are attracted um, to help the other. Um, there's been thought that it improves flavor sometimes uh, when you plant things together. And also an another thing is, you know, plant things in different areas in your garden. 
Um, so for example, I know I'll probably always get slugs near that my shed where I'm growing those beans, but they don't seem to affect another part of my garden. So you kind of get to know, you know, what's happening in your in your garden space and kind of what works works best. And I also like to grow things in pots too. So I have, for example, some kale in pots, some kale in the garden and in different areas of the garden so that if an insect or uh, you know, a very curious squirrel comes along, they're not gonna necessarily decimate the entire crop that you had because you have some diversity in where you've planted things because it kind of just you know, moves things around. And again, you're sort of working with nature, not against it. So if you can try to, to deal with things as organically as possible and have as healthy of a garden as you can possibly have uh, from the start. So you've got healthy soil, really good, healthy plants. Um, if you do see some plants suffering and they're getting you know, attacked by a certain bug and you just can't get ahead of it, it might be worth removing that one plant to save the others you know so if if one of your cucumber plants is just you know a little weakling that that the cucumber beetles seem to really be attracted to removing that the weakest link sometimes uh, will help to improve their neighbors so that's something to think about the healthier your plant is and your soil is the the less likely you're going to have such a devastating uh, result um and either Questions? I've got another couple of folks on the call if they're interested in asking, or maybe I just gave you all the info that you needed. <laughs> I know I, I came at I came at this thinking, well, it'll just be like a sort of open open forum, but I can't couldn't help myself because I know there's certain things I'm seeing right now, and I'm sure a lot of us are seeing. That's the other thing. You're not alone. If you've got, you know, a certain insect or a little critter. You're likely not the only one, and particularly where we live, um, we're probably going to have very similar uh, critters and creatures and that kind of thing. So it's, it's something that's, you know, it's kind of encouraging to know that you're not alone uh, with these, with these uh, issues. I'll just uh, list some resources here. So these are my go-tos. Um, I love the internet. I mean... I do have a, a book that's listed here, uh, The Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Pest and Disease Control, which is really awesome and excellent. Deals with a lot of common um, problems that you might find and how to deal with them organically, which is what I'd like to do as much as I can. Uh, so that's a really great book, but the internet is so at our disposal. Um, I mean, right now through this pandemic, there's so many online source resources like this and so many workshops and a lot of organizations just expanding what they're offering for education. Um, so the Old Farmer's Almanac, whether it's the book form or the website, the website's amazing. It has everything from you know, starting a seed to harvesting it. And it really is looking at organic methods, which I really appreciate. So it's a really good all around you know, helpful um, resource that has been forever. And it's a lot of old knowledge that you know doesn't go out of style. So it's all really good, solid information. Uh, another favorite is uh, Savvy Gardening. Um, so they've got a website and they also a really active uh, Facebook page. They're based out of Eastern Canada, but really applicable stuff. Um, they talk about trellising. So Patty, if you're interested in uh, looking at trellis ideas, they do a whole articles about that. Um, and also sort of, you know, what you can use that you are, might already have on hand. So they're, they're looking at just really accessible, um, easy, to, easy to follow kind of information. Um, or they'll have like top five, you know, things to look at for a particular issue. And nine times out of 10, it's something that, oh, I really want to know about that. And I'll investigate further. Um, the Innisfil Sea Library website has lots of links to resources, um, as well as some original content as well. Um, so, you know, lots of things related to growing seeds, saving seeds, um, and some, you know, everything in between. And of course, my Mindful Gardening uh, website as well has um, uh, my video, uh, links to my videos. So I'm trying to uh, create videos that, you know, I'm things I'm dealing with in my garden, when I'm harvesting things, when I'm you know, I'd hope to maybe do one on on sort of pests and how I dealing with them. So it's kind of a next chapter to look at, but uh, you'll find all sorts of information there as well. So again, if you can kind of have your your go to resources, 
uh, that you can, you know, have quickly at your fingertips. Um, it's it's always a, a good good thing to have under your belt if you don't, especially if you don't know or something's a bit of a mystery. Um, like that tortoise beetle was quite the thing for me to figure out because I had to describe it on Google. <laughs> you know, beetle with a shell that looks like a turtle, and, and somehow I found tortoise beetle. Um, but it, it can often be, uh, you know, kind of detective work to figure it out and to figure out the best strategy to eliminate it and not have them, you know, ruin your crop. Yeah, we're just at about 10 minutes left. Yeah, I do, I do recommend those, those resources. Just have them kind of in your back pocket. And again, we're recording this so you can uh, come back to this uh, session and, and have a look and, and uh, yeah, either the, the bug ID is, is a really good one because those are really common bugs that you'll find uh, in our region. Again, those are my contacts. And again, you know, you can feel free to, to get in touch with me. Um, you know, if you come across something weird and, or if you have pictures, because I know it's, it's hard to do in a session like this, but uh, if you have um, photos that, you know, you're not sure what it is or, or the damage that's done, because often you don't actually see the insect, unfortunately, especially if it's a nighttime uh, critter or, you know, sometimes a, a bunny will chop down your plant. Um, I did see someone had that happen to them recently but it wasn't right at the base level. So I'm like, okay, it's probably not a cutworm <laughs> now that I've experienced that. But it was, uh, she was quite sure it was a bunny because she had had issues with bunnies doing that, just sort of uh, cutting the plant in half and leaving it, leaving it on the ground. So uh, yeah. And again, this is a, a series. So um, we have our, our next one uh, coming up in, in July and that one will, will be uh, grow more. So we'll be looking at uh, succession planting. So, you know, planting more um, at the end of the season, so to speak, to harvest in the fall, as well as uh, looking at what you, you can plant uh, at the end of the season for next year, uh, particularly garlic. So some of those, uh, you know, the season isn't over even though we're rolling along. So uh, I really suggest you check out check that out. And of course, our Q&As will continue uh, as well. And then you can uh, bring your questions there. And again, if you have questions anytime, either get in touch with me or with Sarah uh, at Rosardo, and, uh, you know, we'll try to try to help you out. Yeah, so I guess if there aren't any other questions, or you're not thinking of anything right now, I just want to say thanks so much uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, yeah, get growing. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Bridget.